Welcome to the NEB TV webinar series. Today I'm joined by two of our scientists, Laurence Etwillier and Jennifer Ong. Hello. Hello. How are you? And could you tell us what we're talking about today? Today we'll be talking about how library preparation affects sequencing accuracy. Great, let's get started. Hello, welcome to NEB TV webinar on how preparation affects sequencing accuracy. My name is Lauren Setwiller. I'm a staff scientist in the research department of New England Biolabs. Today, I'm going to talk about the result of my recent paper on DNA damage and its effect on sequencing accuracy. Since the completion of the human genome in 2003, sequencing human is mostly about finding the few differences in the ocean of identical sequences. There are roughly one variant per 300 base pair and this number can be higher in the case of notably cancer. But this number gives you a baseline value of the number of identical bases that we need to sequence in order to detect one variation. Since we are focused on differences, sequencing requires high accuracy to be able to identify variants. Fortunately, Illumina sequencing has a pretty good accuracy with most of the bases called with a quality score between 30 and 40. FRAG quality score is a measure of the quality of the identification of the base generated by next generation sequencing. It, rather, it was originally developed for freight based calling to help in the automation of DNA sequencing in the Human Genome Project. At 30, the probability of making an incorrect base call is one for every thousand bases. It's, a, it's good, but not perfect. German variants are usually shared by all sequences in the case of a homozygote variant, half of the sequences in the case of a heterozygote variant. Therefore, with enough coverage, we can easily distinguish a true variant from sequencing error that tend to be stochastic. In this example, we can observe a germline T to C variant at the position highlighted in blue. All the reads share this variant, and the more reads we have at this position, the more certain we are that this, that this C to T variant is real. Coverage, therefore, compensates sequencing errors. But for certain samples, variants may not be shared with the majority of the sequences. For example, tumor acquire somatic variants that are found in only a few cells, giving rise to intratumoral heterogeneity. In the case of a rare variant, only one or a few reads at a specific genomic position will have the evidence of the variant. Coming back to our previous sequencing example, our read variants such as the G to T in red or C to A in green true variants share with just a few small subpopulation of cells, or is it a sequencing error? In the case of the C to T in green, the FRED quality score is 20, which is one error every 100 base. So this read variant is likely originated from an error during sequencing, maybe during the clustering step, and can be easily removed by filtering them out based on the quality score. For the G to T variant, though, in red, this variant has, a, has the FRED quality score of 35, which is one error every roughly 3,000 base. Less likely to be a sequencing error, but nonetheless can be an artifact. In this presentation, Jennifer and I will look at the origin of artifactual variants with high FRED quality score. Those errors are unlikely the result of Illumina sequencing, but are introduced before, during library preparation. Those are the most pernicious error because they cannot just simply be filtered out using low quality score. In the first part of the presentation, I will focus on damage, while in the second part of the presentation, Jennifer will tackle errors that are introduced during DNA amplification. Damage can be introduced during DNA storage or library preparation, but not all damage are equally bad for sequencing accuracy. 
For NGS, it all depends how the damage is handled by the DNA polymerase during amplification or clustering. Also, the end repair step may handle damage differently because the type of polymerases used are different. Based on the effect of damage on sequencing, we can classify damages in three groups. In the first group, the polymerase goes through the damage and incorporates the correct base. In this case, there is no consequence for sequencing. On the second group, the damage stalls the polymerase, and while there is no consequence in sequencing accuracy, the blocking damage tends to decrease library yield. Finally, the last bullet point describes the most problematic damage, the mutagenic damage. In the case of a mutagenic damage, the polymerase goes through the damage but incorporates the wrong base. In this case, this misincorporation will lead to an artifactual variant during sequencing. The same type of damage tends to lead to the same type of misincorporation. For example, oxidative damage leads to 8 oxoguanin, drives the polymerase to incorporate an adenine instead of a cytosine, thus a G to T error signature. That is a problem, because in the case of a cancer, cells also have mutational, sig mutational signatures. There is mutation 18 from the Alexandrov paper in 2013 showing a C2A or G2T mutation that is predominantly found in this type of cancers. And this makes sense because some cancers are originated from exposure to agents that cause a systematic damage leading to a systematic misincorporation of nucleotides. Those misincorporations are fixed after many generations of cells, leading to, in this case, G to T or C to A somatic variants. So how do we distinguish real G to T or C to A somatic variants that are fixed in the cancer cell population compared to artifactual damage from the library preparation that will get fixed after PCR amplification or clustering? It turned out that we can actually make the distinction between variants derived from damage versus real variants. As the damage in the DNA is by definition unfixed, it turned out that damage is only affecting one base in the pairing, the other base is not affected. Additionally, Illumina sequencing is directional in a sense that, in a parent mode, the read 1 is reading the original strand, while read 2 is reading the reverse complement of the original strand. In the case of a non-fixed damage, this directionality leads to a global imbalance in the total number of variant type between read 1 and read 2. We then devise a score by V score that stands for global imbalance value. We experimentally demonstrate that the GIV score is specifically measuring errors due to damage. For this, we acoustically shear the human genomic DNA in unbuffered solution to introduce 8 oxoguanin into the DNA, leading to a G2T errors as previously demonstrated by Costello and all. Half of the sample is then treated with a cocktail of repair enzyme to repair the 8 oxoguanin, while the other half is directly sequenced using Illumina. The graph that you see represents the G2T variant frequency on the read function of the position on the read. The left panel represents read 1, and the right panel represents read 2 of the paired end. You can immediately appreciate the difference between the variant frequency in read 1 and read 2 in the non-repair sample in blue. If the sample is repaired, this is the case in the, in the red, the variant frequency drops to baseline, and the imbalance is gone. This result demonstrates that the imbalance in variant frequency between read 1 and read 2 is the result of damage. The, <clears throat> the GIV score is freely available on GitHub. It estimates the mutagenic damage of a sample using as low as 2 million reads and can easily be implemented as part of the QC pipeline. We use the GIV score to estimate damage in a public genomic database such as the Southern Genome Project and the Cancer Genome Atlas on the right. 
we calculate the GIV score for all possible substitution and order the substitution class by increased average GIV score. The substitution class with the highest GIV score for both the Cancer Genome Atlas and the Southern Genome Project uh, dataset is by far the G2T class, suggesting widespread oxidative damage on the guanosine. Any point above the solid gray line represents the sequencing run, where more than one-third of the G2T substitution on the reads are derived from damage and are therefore artifactual. Next, instead of looking at artifactual bion directly on the read, we investigated the consequence of damage at genomic position with high sequencing coverage. As we have seen before, coverage compensates sequencing errors, and because damage is stochastic, we expect damage to primarily compound the identification of low allelic variants. To better assess the effect of DNA damage on those variants, we sequence the target set of cancer genes from a tumor sample with or without DNA repair and normalize the coverage to 300-fold. We counted the number of variants on the y-axis and the type of variants, for example, G2T in orange or its reverse complement, C2A in blue, and classify them in four groups. Variant frequency of less than 1%, 1 to 5%, 6 to 10 percent, and higher than 10 percent. We identified success of G2T variants in orange in the non-repair sample for notably variant frequency of less than 1 percent and 1 to 5 percent. If the sample is repaired, the G2T variant frequency drops to numbers that are similar to the C2A variant frequency. Conversely, Variants present in the sample at high frequencies, such as germline variants, show the same profile with or without repair. This result demonstrates that damage confirms the identification of low allelic variants. If we now look at the variant defined by the National Cancer Institute GDC data portal, the fraction of G2T variants in the variant file is elevated in samples that are severely damaged in red, compared to samples that have no or little damage detected in blue. This is true for both the raw somatic mutation files and the annotated mutation files. This result suggests that a number of variants in these files are false and are due to damage instead. With this presentation, I hope to have convinced you of the importance and pervasive nature of mutagenic damage in sequencing. This damage leads to systematic error that can be measured using a simple metric called the GIV score that measures the extent of the imbalance between read 1 and read 2. Finally, damage confounds the identification of variants, especially the low allelic fraction variants found in cancer. And now I turn to Jennifer for the second part of the presentation. Thank you, Laurence. Hello, everyone. My name is Jennifer Ong, and I'm a senior scientist at New England BioLab. In part two, I'll discuss a recent paper from our lab describing DNA amplification errors and how these can affect sequencing accuracy. The polymerase chain reaction, or PCR, is a DNA amplification method integral to many next-generation sequencing sample preparation workflows, including our own NEB Next Ultra 2. Therefore, any errors that are introduced during PCR will also increase the total number of sequencing errors. PCR is an exponential DNA amplification method, which is used to amplify a target sequence located between two primers. During amplification, the target sequence is copied, and then copies are made of those copies. This allows a large amplification from small amounts of material, but it also means that any errors introduced during PCR get copied and amplified as well. We want to measure the frequency and types of errors made during PCR to help us understand their contribution to next-generation sequencing. To do this, we set up a very accurate fidelity assay based on Pacific Biosciences single-molecule real-time sequencing. Smart sequencing sequences individual DNA molecules, and because each molecule is sequenced multiple times, you can achieve very high accuracy in a process called circular consensus sequencing. This high accuracy is what allows us to distinguish true PCR errors from sequencing errors. To measure the errors generated during PCR, 
we sequenced the pool of molecules that were produced during DNA amplification. Sequencing libraries were prepared from these PCR products by ligating hairpin-shaped smart bill adapters onto the ends of each product, which produces a circular DNA template. During sequencing, the sequencing primer is extended around the circular template in a rolling circle amplification. Rolling circle amplification produces very long sequencing reads that are iterative copies of the top and bottom strand inserts, separated by adapter sequences. The iterative copies of each top and bottom strand, called subreads, allow us to generate a very accurate consensus sequence for the top and the bottom strand. In this example, the true PCR error, shown in green, is present in all subreads on the bottom strand, whereas the sequencing errors, illustrated in gray, are randomly distributed and are washed out of the consensus sequence. In our study, we looked at several different types of PCR errors, including polymerase base substitution events, PCR-mediated recombination, and mutagenic DNA damage caused by thermocycling. Probably the most well-characterized of these errors are polymerase base substitutions. These occur when the polymerase incorporates the wrong nucleotide during replication. But we also wanted to look at less well-characterized mistakes, like PCR-mediated recombination. This occurs when you're amplifying a mixed pool of closely related but not identical sequences, and template switching by the polymerase produces chimeric PCR products. This could lead to sequencing artifacts for certain types of next-generation sequencing assays. Finally, we also wanted to measure the rate of mutagenic DNA damage that occurs from heating during thermocycling. One of the first things that we wanted to do is to compare the substitution error rates for different DNA polymerases. And in this table here, I'm showing the error rates of two different commonly used polymerases for PCR, TAC polymerase and Q5 DNA polymerase. And in a typical fidelity experiment, we'll sequence about 100 million high accuracy consensus bases in order to derive these error rates. For TAC polymerase, this turns out to be 1.5 times 10 to the minus 4 substitutions per base per doubling event, and this corresponds to an accuracy of about one substitution every 6,000 bases replicated. In comparison, Q5 DNA polymerase has a much lower substitution rate at 5.3 times 10 to the minus 7 substitutions per base per doubling event. This corresponds to an accuracy of one substitution every 1.9 million bases replicated, and in comparison to TAC, this is about 280-fold higher fidelity. These error rates are actually pretty low for the DNA polymerase. However, because of the exponential nature of PCR, an error that occurs in an early PCR cycle will be replicated and get propagated through the amplification product. So after 16 cycles of PCR, if you're using a low-fidelity TAC polymerase and amplifying 1KB, about 60% of the fragments will contain at least one error, whereas if you're using Q5, only 0.3% of the fragments amplified will contain at least one error. And this kind of shows the importance of using a high-fidelity polymerase for amplification. We then went on to compare the fidelity for several high-fidelity DNA polymerases commonly used for next-generation sequencing sample preparation workflows. In addition to Q5, we also looked at several engineered DNA polymerases, such as Fusion, Primestar GXL, and Kappa Hi-Fi ReadyMix. We also looked at several wild-type DNA polymerases from Archaea, such as DeepVent, PFU, and KOD DNA polymerases. And in this graph here, we're showing the fidelity relative to TAC polymerase. So the higher fidelity, the lower the error rate, and the more accurate the enzyme. In addition to determining the error rate for each polymerase, we're also able to identify the mutations that each typically makes. And in this mutation spectrum here, I'm showing the distribution of the different error types. For example, TAC polymerase, which is a family A DNA polymerase, tends to make errors that are A to G or T to C substitutions 68% uh, of the time. The other high-fidelity polymerases, which are all related to family B DNA polymerases, these tend to make errors that are more G to A or C to T substitutions the majority of the time. Okay, so we're on to our next type of PCR error, PCR-mediated recombination. Recombination can occur during amplification of a mixed pool of closely related sequences 
that may be nearly identical but maybe only differ by a few mutations. We set out to develop an assay to measure the rate of recombination using these pairs of artificial sequences illustrated here by DNA1 and DNA1X. These are nearly identical, only differing by a mutation every 100 base pairs spread out across the length of the gene. Uh, these mutations then serve as markers to help us distinguish between these two template sequences. We then use TAC polymerase to amplify a mixed population of these two sequences during PCR and then sequence the products. If there is no recombination that occurred after amplification, then the product should only have the markers from one of the templates. However, if a recombination event has occurred, then this strand will be a chimeric product, which will have the markers from both of the templates. And as illustrated here, you can see that a recombination event has occurred after the third marker, where it switches from red to blue. These types of recombination events, uh, we also call them crossover events, can occur during PCR when a polymerase extends a primer but then falls off before it reaches the end of the template. During the next cycle of PCR, this extended primer can anneal to a different template and then become extended. Uh, the resulting product is a chimeric product. And this can cause confusion because this has a different types of mutations than the original starting pool. So we wanted to measure the rate of recombination events by counting up the number of crossover events that we see after amplification. We measured the rate of template switching for TAC polymerase using two of these types of template pairs. We measured the number of crossover events that occurred after a 16-cycle PCR amplification, and also the total number of sequence bases to get at the recombination rate, which ended up being on average about 1 times 10 to the minus 4 per base per doubling event. So these recombination events ended up being very rare at the polymerase level, but because this is PCR and errors get amplified, this means that after 16 cycles, we saw that 23% or 28% of the strands that were produced had at least one recombination event. And this is just another example of these really rare mistakes that polymerases make, producing a large amount of error in the final uh, PCR products. And so one of the last topics that I wanted to talk about was mutagenic damage that can occur during thermocycling. And so for these experiments, we made plasmid DNA libraries, subjected them to thermocycling, where we heat and cool the DNA as you would in PCR for 16 cycles, and then measured the error rates. So if we just took the plasmid DNA and measured the error rates with no thermocycling, uh, this had an error rate of about 4 times 10 to the minus 7. If we then subjected the plasmid libraries to heating and cooling for 16 mock thermocycles, the error rate went up. Uh, almost two orders of magnitude to about 2 times 10 to the minus 5 per base. We then used a pre-CR cocktail. Uh, Pre-CR is an enzyme mixture that recognizes and repairs DNA damage. We then took our heated libraries and treated them with pre-CR and measured the error rate again and found that the error rate after pre-CR treatment and mock recycling went back down to basal levels. And so to us, this indicated that heating and cooling actually causes DNA damage um, that can be repaired by pre-CR. The identity of the mutations after heating and cooling were all C to T substitutions. And so C to C substitutions are an indicator of a cytosine deamination. And so we concluded that heating and cooling during PCR um, causes mutagenic damage. And per PCR cycle, this happens about once every 700,000 bases. And so I would like to conclude part two by summarizing our analysis of PCR products at the single molecule level. We measured polymerase base substitution error rates, as well as other types of PCR errors, including PCR-mediated recombination, the result of template switching during amplification of closely related sequences. We also looked at how much DNA damage occurs during thermocycling and found that heating causes cytosine deamination, which results in C to T substitutions um, upon sequencing. If you're interested in learning more about the topics discussed here, the links for these two papers are available in the resources widget in the webinar console. Laurence and I will also be available to answer questions.
Hello, everyone. Okay, so it looks like we have one question here about uh, potential genomic content, uh, content for errors by TAC polymerase. Um, and it's true that TAC polymerase tends to make errors mainly in A's and T's. So if you're amplifying a genome or a specific amplicon that's very AT rich, then you'll see more errors uh, in, the, in those kinds of sequence contexts. Uh, there was also another question about uh, any sequence context uh, for crossover events uh, by TAC polymerase. And for the simple recombination assay, uh, we did not see any positional effects for the location of the crossover event, but in our paper, uh, we also looked at amplification of particular sequences. Uh, one of those was the LAC-Z amplicon, which contained certain structural elements uh, that were inverted repeats. And these structural elements did induce a form of template switching um, that, we, that we observed uh, over amplification of these uh, particular sequences. Uh, so the answer is that some sequence contexts can also promote uh, recombination or crossover events. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to take a question um, regarding um, the, so I'm reading the question, is there any way to address this issue in interim data set? I'm assuming that the issue is the damage. Um, so, uh, because damage happens, um, the, for example, oxidative damage happen um, before PCR, before sequencing, um, the damage will be fixed at the moment of sequencing. Uh, so, iron torrent will not fix, uh, it will not help uh, with, the, uh, with sequencing. Uh, you, will have, you will have errors due to damage uh, with iron torrent as well. Um, additionally, uh, as far as I know, there's no imbalance in iron torrents, so uh, um, no, uh, there is paired end sequencing. So uh, you will not be able to uh, look at the imbalance, the GIV score uh, in an iron torrent um, uh, platform. Um. So uh, getting, going back to some of the PCR questions, um, it looks like some, uh, there's questions about does the rate of he heating and cooling during PCR affect DNA damage? Uh, I think that probably the amount of time, the heating uh, at 98 degrees during the denaturation temperature is probably what is promoting hydrolysis or cytosine deamination. So, the length of t so I think that the length of time uh, at elevated temperatures like 98 degrees or the number of cycles uh, would then promote um, d more DNA damage. Um, I have a question. Um, can you use the GIV score to remove low frequency variant caused by DNA damage? If so, it works with downstream analysis. Um, so currently, we can't. So we cannot use. Uh, the GIV score uh, to remove the, um, the specific variants that we call. Um, the GIV is a global uh, imbalance value, so it takes uh, the reads that um, the, the, the sequencing read um, directly um, up to two million reads. So um, we don't we we do not have this feature in the GIV score. Okay. Uh, so what are the questions about PCR? Uh, we're, uh, we're being asked, uh, why do we only do the test with 16 cycles of PCR and not 30 to 40 cycles um, as most uh, PCR methods? So we chose to use uh, 16 cycles of PCR because after we found that for the conditions that we're using and the amount of template that we're using, after 16 cycles, uh, the um, amplification reaction is still in the linear range um, and we haven't saturated the reaction yet. So we're trying to um, uh, perform PCR under conditions where amplification is still occurring um, at, uh, in the later cycles. If we performed uh, more cycles of PCR, then, uh, the rea then the amplification reaction would be saturated at that point. Uh, yes, so I have a question regarding um, the GIV score. Could you explain the GIV score a bit more? Uh, so, so the the idea is that um, if you have if you have a, 
uh, damage, the damage is uh, non-fixed. So uh, in one of the in in one of the strands you will have the damage, while on the other strand you don't have the damage. The other thing is that damage always uh, a certain type of damage always lead to the certain type of uh, change. The, the polymerase always behave a certain way when it um, when it encounter damage. So for example, an oxidative damage, as the case of atoxoguanin, uh, you will have a G to T. Um, always when you, ha when you have uh, atoxoguanin. So um, this is uh, unfixed in the case of uh, damage. And uh, the second thing is that the alumina is uh, directional. So uh, when, you, when you start uh, sequencing, when you, when you um, um, ligate your adapters, you have a P5 and a P7. And the P5 reads, or read one, P5 is read one, uh, reads uh, um, the, um, the, the strand, the original strand, while P7 reads the reverse complement of the original strands. And so when you, when you do this, and um, <clears throat> you will have a, um, an excess of G to T to, on read one compared to uh, C to A on, on, um, on read one versus C to A on read two. Um, relative to G to T on read two. So it's this imbalance that uh, we are measuring in the case of damage. If it's a true variant, the, vari the true variant is fixed. Uh, so you will have the, the changes in both strands, and therefore you will have no imbalance. OK, so I have another question here. What are the sequencing accuracy, um, e.g. stimp calling, implications of crossover over events during PCR? So crossover events during PCR can have implications for certain NGS assays. Uh, for instance, if you're amplifying a pool of uh, viral populations which have very related sequences to each other, um, or in microbial identification when you're amplifying 16S RNA genes, uh, which are very closely related, uh, and you're trying to sequence uh, the original viral population or uh, the original uh, 16S uh, genes, and if you have a crossover event, you may see one mutation or one sequence then get combined with another sequence, and it will be a synthetic error. It will, be, it will not be a sequence that was originally present um, in your starting pool, and so it may seem like you have a new viral variant or a new microbe, um, or if you're doing haplotyping, a new uh, type uh, in your sequencing pool that didn't originally exist. So um, I have another question. Uh, would you recommend DNA damage repair before Illumina sequencing as a normal part of a protocol? Um, if you're talking about um, atoxoguanin, so the, the damage that is introduced during uh, sharing of the DNA, uh, you can first uh, uh, change the buffer um, composition. So instead of 0.1 TE, which is what um, people tend to use, I uh, use a different buffer, um, one time T, for example. Um, <clears throat> uh, if, though uh, using one time T, uh, you will remove most of the damage, but not everything. So if you really want to remove all the damage, um, you may want to try pre-CR. I have another question here about PCR. Uh, do you believe most errors in the PCR experiments come from damage to the bases in the template or growing strand or from damage to the nucleotide pool? Does the fact that thermocycling itself caused damage uh, suggest it's in the template? Um, or maybe there are different types of damage in the template versus the nucleotide pool? So uh, there have been experiments done uh, which shows that, yes, uh, heating does cause damage, um, again, citizen deamination to the nucleotide pool, um, which then can uh, get incorporated into uh, the PCR products. So thermal cycling does cause damage to both the template strand um, and also the nucleotide pool and can cause uh, C to T substitutions um, in the final product. Mm. 
So I have another question. Was seed deamination in any way, shape, form, effect by methylation or genomic CPG content? Um, so what we we have we have done mostly is um, samples that um, are fresh. So the mutation is mostly a G to T due to oxidative damage. Uh, C deamination happened mostly on FFP samples. Uh, we have not looked in this study at um, FFP samples. Okay. The question here is, how does the number of, uh, number of PCR-mediated mutations introduced compare to the number of mutations introduced during the actual sequencing? Um, depending on the quality score, uh, usually the number of sequencing errors um, can be quite high for Lumina sequencing, and these are probably more um, than the polymerase-induced errors, but the polymerase-induced errors actually add to the total number um, of sequencing errors. And it depends on, um, it depends a little bit on the data analysis and um, what types of, of filters you, you're using for, um, uh, for base calling. So there's another question here. Does the length of the fragment when doing PCR affect damage or errors caused during PCR? And for long amplification, uh, DNA damage or errors then be becomes um, more of a problem for producing very long amplicons. Um, so I think it's maybe the, more of the opposite way around, that damage um, maybe prevents a longer amplification um, than for shorter products. Uh, yes, so do you think, so I have another question. Do you think treatment of the amplified library of Precia to correct DNA damage arising from thermocycling should be added to library preparation workflow? Um, so the, the Precia as it currently stands is, uh, will not stand the temperature. So the, the PC, during PCR, uh, you will fix the, um, you will fix the damage that is introduced during the, the cycling, um, and therefore um, you cannot use pre-CR um, during PCR. <laughs> uh, so it's the the, um, the damage can only be fixed before or after. I'm getting a couple of questions here. Um, are there polymerases that have lower rates of recombination than TAC? or are there ways of reducing chimeric formation during PCR? Uh, this is an active area, this is an area of interest for us. Um, I wanted to do a further study looking at different polymerases and that's something that we've planned for the future but don't have a good answer for this uh, yet. I do think that PCR mediated recombination uh, is probably more related to the PCR protocol and the cycling conditions um, than maybe that the polymerase itself. <coughs> Uh, so we have a couple of uh, questions about how pre-CR uh, works, so I will uh, let uh, Tom answer this question. Yeah. Hi, I was listening in on the seminar and this question came up, um, it was developed in my, my lab. So pre-CR <clears throat> um, has a lot of the enzymes that are found in basic scission repair. So there's a number of enzymes like FPG, um, Endo8, uh, these types of enzymes that will go in and recognize damage and cause a uh, break in the double-stranded DNA chain, then there's a DNA polymerase, a BST a DNA polymerase full length that goes in and does nick, a short little NIC translation to make a little repair patch, and then there's also a DNA ligase present, so it fully seals the, um, seals the NIC after it's been translated so that the damage is actually fully repaired. I mean, clearly because it requires um, a template strand to do the repair, it works uh, most effectively on double-stranded DNA. Um, if there's single-stranded DNA, some of the DNA repair enzymes will actually remove the damage, but as there's no template strand, uh, there will be no um, additional uh, bases added in to, to repair it. It'll just simply uh, remove the damage. Okay. So I have a question here about 
um, does deamination of DCTP in the nucleotide pool um, or damage uh, for, to the nucleotide pool, does this affect in the incorporation rate, uh, mutated versus non-mutated DCTP? So when DCTP is deaminated, it becomes DUTP. Uh, DUTP is very similar to thymidine, and the incorporation rate is probably not that affected. Um, uh, probably not that affected that much. Um, I have another question. Um, how would you limit or what is the best way DNA damage in, um, in the typical DNA extraction library prep? Um, so most of the damage, it depends on the on the sample. Uh, so if it's a fresh sample, uh, uh, the most of the damage comes from uh, the shearing of the DNA uh, during during sonication. Uh, and in that case, uh, the, the the first way to limit the damage is to increase the buffer composite the the buffer uh, potential of the of the solution during shearing. Um, it turns out that. Um, the way you isolate DNA may also affect um, the uh, the damage, so that something that we have not really looked at, but it, I think there is um, uh, there there is a correlation there. Um, but really, the the buffer composition is the um, is really what would uh, make the the damage uh, be limited. Uh, the, if you want to really remove the oxidative damage, then um, pre-CR would, uh, would also work for that. Okay, so I had a question about uh, PCR errors, and do they affect Sanger sequencing uh, as much as NGS? And it depends a little on how you're preparing your samples for Sanger sequencing. Uh, with Sanger sequencing, because you're uh, sequencing a pool of molecules, uh, if you're sequencing a, the, uh, a PCR product, for instance, you would get, your Sanger sequencing would be a consensus of the entire pool, which would actually probably be more accurate because things like um, errors or DNA damage would be um, washed away in the in building the consensus, um, or if you're uh, using Sanger sequencing uh, to sequence PCR products that have been cloned into a plasmid um, and then and then um, purified from E. coli, the cell has uh, DNA damage repair pathways that will repair the damage and um, reduce the uh, sequencing error when you're um, when you actually perform Sanger sequencing. So I think that's all of the questions that we're going to have time to take today. Um, we will be providing the webinar on demand as well and following up with each of you with your questions. Um, thank you so much for joining and have a great day.